Okay. Yeah, welcome back. Welcome back. Okay. All right. We'll, <clears throat> we're moving on to our uh, next um, chapter, which is uh, managing your home or home management. Okay. Um, we, we've, this is another aspect of, uh, again, a very practical uh, aspect of managing marriage and a home. Right, mm, and this is specific. Just providing certain practical tips and uh, um, ways on how um, you know things that may be very maybe ordinary or things that may may not occur to us as significant, but could be points of conflict or could be points of distress for a home. All right. So we're going to be looking at um, managing homes, certain aspects of it, certain areas that uh, husband and wife, a husband wife team should mainly look into. Okay. Just taking from scripture, Proverbs 24, 3 to 4, I'm on page. Um, uh, Sorry, I'm just getting the page number. Uh, I'm on page number 84. Page number 84. Uh, would somebody kindly read? There are two, two, two verses, Proverbs 24, 3 and 4, and Proverbs 24, 6. Could somebody kindly unmute and read the verse, please? Proverbs 24, 3 and 4. Homes are built on the foundation of wisdom and understanding. Where there is knowledge, the rooms are furnished with valuable, beautiful things. Proverbs 24, 6. After all, you must make careful plans before you fight a battle. And the more good advice you get, the more likely you are to win. Thank you, Anita. Okay, so as scripture shows, uh, a home is built with wisdom and with understanding, and it requires careful planning. So it is important to look at practical ways in how life can be made easier, can be made smoother. The home can be a wonderful place to live in. Okay. Okay. I sorry. I, I think I missed a question here. Kennedy has asked a question. What is your advice on cultural sex between married couples guided with seasons? Example, planting or harvesting, maybe after burials. Okay. Uh, Kennedy, could you, um, would you give us, give me a background of this, please? Because I, I suppose this could be something like you said, culturally. This is something that may be um, prevalent. Could you, would you kindly unmute and give us, give me a small background of this, please? <laughs> okay, my, my question was, I feel like there are so many, like in uh, African cultural setup, eh? there are certain stuff that people do, like during planting season, people have to have sex, couples, or maybe after burials, or maybe when they want to start a new project, I mean, they're doing a construction. So I just wanted your advice or guidance on that kind of cultural practices that are, in, that are tied to sex. You know, the cultural practices that are tied to sex between couples. Okay, so I think it's it's very cultural that maybe in a in a specific season, there uh, you know they engage in more sex or they, they or they don't engage in sex. Is that right? Exactly. Exactly. Ah, yeah. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I think certain principles that we can go by is one that um, that the uh, scripture says abstinence from sex could be for a reason of you know prayer or fasting or uh, you know probably at a time that maybe one person is unwell or um, you know th those are specific reasons for it, uh, but things that maybe culturally. Uh, I don't think that it, it's a cultural practice, and there isn't any. Uh, I don't think it's. Oh, it's uh, there is a there is a specific yes or no to it. I mean, you can have sex as long as it's mutual, um, within in in marriage among married couples. 
as long as it's mutually agreed upon at whenever time whatever season um whatever uh, uh, hour of the day that's perfectly okay uh, as long as it's not used as a weapon against one another you know at at times of conflict or times of issues apart from that um i don't see uh, this to really impact uh sexual experience and I'm, i'm not too sure if i'm missing something out culturally maybe i could just probably read through that this is interesting because um uh you know uh, as part of our culture in the indian culture um there is you know there are uh, there are other uh, other specific aspects you know uh, sex is not permitted when the woman is going through her menstruation um or sex is not permitted at the i think even there are certain days of uncleanliness that um, you know culturally that is that is seen and you're not allowed to um engage uh in sexual in sexual uh, contact also even culture and we see part of this also we've seen some of this even in the old testament where it talks but those were as part of the law and we know that we are, that uh you know from the new testament um we are at a period of uh, grace so those things that may have been binding earlier are not we are not spiritually bound by those uh, those specific rituals at this point of time so i think it's something as similar but if there is anything else that i i'll, I'll do a bit of reading on this uh, because i may not be completely um uh, adept to the culture that you're maybe talking about and if there is anything further i can definitely bring this up kennedy in our next class right okay all right so we we're, we're moving into um uh, certain areas of uh, managing the home uh, th- these these are simple uh, areas but yet i think it's important to bring it up in a discussion so the first one we're looking at is staying independently uh, as per scripture which talks about in genesis 224 it says Uh, that you know this is marriage is where a man leaves his father and his mother and is united to his wife and they become one okay so as a good practice it is important for couples um to make a home of their own all right and it is necessary that they come to an agreement that where they would make their home and these are certain things that should be discussed way before marriage uh during this the time when they are preparing for marriage like i said it is good for a couple to make a home for themselves separate from their uh families of origin because it helps them to learn uh you know uh, to build their relationship with one another it also helps them to uh be interdependent it also helps them to understand how practically a home is is built so then when when a couple lives separately they have the freedom to focus on themselves and their marriage and their relationship and their home even doing simple small things you know like setting up a home ensuring that things are in order that things are bought all of that requires partnership all of that requires engaging with one another and it it is good that a couple forms that and so we do encourage that especially in the early years of marriage that a couple live begin by living together uh, alone away from uh, from the parents but a lot of times this may not be completely possible because of um, you know maybe there are certain constraints there could be um, a need for financial help from from uh, from the families or there could be probably there is um, a, a widowed father or a mother sorry a widowed uh, parent who may be staying alone so as as a sense of uh, uh, kindness and goodness to be able to stay with them so it may not always be possible but it, this should be done in mutual understanding on where 
uh, the the two of them plan to stay okay so even if there may be an immediate member that uh, that that may need to stay alongside with them it should be a, it should be mutually uh, agreed upon however there is there will be an expectation that the uh, that the extended family um, does not interfere uh, with the growing of this uh, of this family so um, you know either uh, either interference either coming through the way the couple lives or uh, how they make decisions together um, how they bring up their children how um, you know how they manage their money or uh, how how things need to be controlled so that there those boundaries need to be placed um, if there is an extended family member living with the couple so that it doesn't give rise to any any uh, any any kind of a conflict okay it it's also possible like we said that um, you may be living with uh, especially in our culture in the indian culture i and i think uh, it's more prevalent way south um, uh, of of our country, that that staying with the wife's family uh, is not uh, appears to be um, uh, you know a, a definite question for the for the husband, right? But we understand that sometimes this is as a result of maybe it could be relocation or any other kind of practical reasons. So even even if that needs to be done, we recommend that it be short for a certain period of time till the need is met. And then they live in their separate places so that they can begin to build um, uh, in, in, in highlighting and focusing on their own their own togetherness and their own marriage. Okay, so that's uh that's uh one that's that's uh to that okay and i think there's another question that's come up uh, what about a marriage uh okay i think this is the previous uh previous chapter what about a marriage where they're not sexually active what advice uh do you have for this couple okay note that they're medically okay all right so um sexuality in marriage is important for intimacy and we did mention that there could be very many reasons why one person loses interest in sex and and that which means there is an underlying factor or there are underlying aspects that impacts um the sexual relationship so there could be many reasons one of them the most common one is uh, uh, you know having an emotional disconnect emotionally disconnecting with one another other probable reasons could have been uh, you know past infidelity or uh, sexual uh, um, you know active sexual addictions that could take place so there there usually could be a reason for that and that's something that needs to be addressed uh, for, uh, with the couple. Often this is under shame and under embarrassment. Uh, I've seen many couples who do not come forth with the concerns that they have because especially in a culture that we are in, the Indian culture, it's not something that is spoken about adequately and especially in the church it's not something that is discussed about but uh, it is needed and you know if the church can equip pastors and counselors to be able to handle the source of a sexual inactive relationship and address that specifically and often you know when you see when the source is uh, uh, handled where time is built together emotions are spoken about there is open communication we tend to see that there is a direct relation between uh, the 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 cause and the and the uh, and sexuality. So I'd say uh, definitely not a good place to be in where you're sexually inactive in a marriage. It causes a lot of temptations. It can cause a lot of um, disconnect and further uh, withdrawal from one another, uh, uh, handing out a, a, a significant challenge to the couple. So it needs to be addressed. It needs to be dealt with uh, as, as soon as possible okay 
Okay, I think Nisha has brought about another question. I have a similar question when the husband denies completely. Every day it is an excuse and the husband gets angry and violent. They have a toddler child and for years the husband has denied any sort of intimacy. Okay, uh, these again, uh, Nisha, I think I uh, it, it is similar to what I have spoken about. There seems to be some underlying factor that causes um, an inactive uh, participation in sexuality. And that is what needs to be addressed. So what you've bought about here in the question is something that's in the externals of it, but there is probably something that's underlying in it as well. Uh, and uh, to know what are some of those concerns. So there, um, so some of the times, um, some of the times, um, I, I think I want to make a mention of this also, is that um, there are psychological conditions where people find it difficult engaging in sex. Okay, either it is premature ejaculation or frigidity. A lot of this um, have a backing to do with anxiety, with depression, uh, and that again becomes an underlying cause for um, for for um, an issue into sexuality. So these are all these all underlying issues is something that needs to be dealt with, needs to be brought up uh, in the open and to be dealt with. Sorry, I think I have a power fluctuation. Apologies. Okay. Um, uh, there was another question. How should the issue of dowry be handled because it is highly abused by in-laws? Okay, the issue dowry in itself, uh, by law, in itself is an offense uh, in the Indian culture. Asking of dowry by law is an offense, and um, so there in itself, you know, scripture says, um, uh, "Be submissive to the law of your land." Right. So if that in itself is something that uh, is an issue, it needs to be brought up by, uh, I mean, if it is happening within the church, it's definitely something that should be brought up and brought about in correction and uh, um, to be set right. Uh, it's not permissible for abuse to happen for the sake of money or for the sake of uh, um, even assets, right? And it, it is something that uh, it should be spoken about in the open and sought help, definitely. But dowry in itself is something that uh, we know is not the law of the land in the in the country we live in. I don't know how it is for y'all there, Kennedy. What what it is there. In fact, in our culture, um, depending on the states that you are in, uh, dowry. Uh, I think in the south, it's more dowry is given. Um, the the woman gives the husband. But I know in the northeastern uh, states, I think Samuel can correct me if I'm wrong, it's the other way around. The husband gives, not dowry, but gives uh, uh, a share to the wife's family. Am I right in that, Samuel? Uh, so I've heard uh, mostly in Shillong, I think, uh, uh, or, or Meghalaya, that's one state. Meghalaya, okay. maybe Nagaland. Uh -huh. um, not in Sikkim, though. Uh, OK. Sikkim is pre predominantly, uh, I think there's some uh, Hindu background culture. So a lot of uh, the traditional old families still follow that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, families that follow a lot of, uh, that come from a Buddhist background, Buddhist culture, which is again another predominant ancient tradition, right. uh, they, they, don't, uh, they don't have a dowry system. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. it's, it's, uh, and even if it's dowry, it's more like uh, because th these are all tribal communities. Mm -hmm. uh, the the most that I've heard is where the bride, uh, the bridegroom, has to uh, when when they're asking for the bride's hand, has mm -hmm. to uh, go to ask the bride's hand with a with an entire uh, pig um, upside down tied to. A, Bamboos are carrying, so the meat meat is what's offered as dowry. Oh, okay. preferably <laughs> an, uh, uh, yeah, and an, an entire um, 
pot roast or something. Okay. And the fatter the pig, the the more uh... <laughs> from the the more easy to get the girl's hand. Girl, right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Samuel. All right. Okay. So I'm uh, going on with with uh, with our current lesson. Right. Okay. We're going to be looking at uh, another area is. Um, uh, daily and weekly schedules. So something that we do see, uh, you know, again, practically is that at this point of time, uh, in, in, in this generation, the season uh, of life, there are people, both the husband and the wife are working. And often it becomes uh, difficult to manage time together uh, depending on certain work schedules because of the hours of work. And this impacts the family because there is minimum time to spend together and this needs to be addressed and uh, 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 to ensure that priority is given to the family to priority is given to the marriage so if it is okay if it is possible for either the husband or the wife to make changes in their jobs so that um, you know the husband and wife get some mutual time mutually to spend with one another. These are important things to be discussed before marriage, because often, uh, and especially do I, uh, you know, we see right now, even as young people get married, there's one person working in one shift, the other is working in the other shift, and they may get to engage with each other maybe an hour or two a day, that's it. And uh, that in itself can have, um, uh, you know, a ripple effect uh, a negative ripple effect on the marriage. So working out these schedules and ensuring that there is enough of time for each other on a regular basis so that the marriage can be uh, built into. Okay. The third area that we're going to be looking at is, yes, household chores. All right. Um, this household chores can be many in nature. I mean, and I know all of us understand because we live in homes there are hundreds of things to do. There's cleaning, there's uh, cooking, there's washing, there's laundry, there's uh, 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 bills payment, there could be shopping, there could be uh, maintaining, um, and if you have pets, there's maintaining pets. There are many, many things that can, that can come about, uh, come through this. And uh, the, the, it is important to know as against what has been traditionally brought down, that only, uh, you know, it is, it is only the responsibility of the woman to take care of the home and the responsibility of the man to bring in the money. Even uh, now, since both could be working, it is important that both the husband and the wife share this responsibility. You know, come where, where sharing a task is, uh, brings about a good teamwork, you know, when you come together and decide how you're going to make your home functional, it requires teamwork and it is a good thing to do. Now, if uh, it may, it is unfair if there is just one spouse doing all the work. Now, I don't want to make the mistake of saying just the woman because, uh, you know, in different cultures, it's probably different, but it is unfair to allow or permit or get only one person to do all the work by themselves because this can significantly put a strain on that one individual. Uh, and the responsibilities become more as children uh, come by, as extended family may become dependent. So it is important right from the beginning to share uh, household chores and serve together as a team. Okay. The next area is, uh, I, I'm just going really quickly through this because, uh, you know, the, these are, um, you know, you can take some time to read it um, uh, and it will, it will give you uh, the entire perspective. The next one is the use of technology. Uh, what we didn't have probably, you know, in our parents' time, they didn't have to deal with phones and laptops and uh, a Mac. Uh, they probably just had maybe uh, at the most a radio or a TV to deal with. Um, but now, because of the way technology has uh, uh, 
expanded so widely, so vastly. Everything is on this phone. Everything is on the phone. Your life is around the phone. You know, so work happens on the phone. Uh, leisure calls happen on the phone. You know, um, maybe even cleanings. Uh, you know, ensuring that your rooms clean happens on the phone through some kind of a robot. So e everything is, uh, you know, is uh, is on a phone or is on some kind of a device. So it is important again to have certain disciplines with regard to this, to the use of a smartphone, to the use of a television or any anything that you may be using uh, for entertainment or for even for work. Ensuring that you're keeping that discipline of keeping away these um, gadgets or any kind of distraction. Uh, this includes any form of social media. It includes any form of uh, entertainment time that you may have, that there are specific periods of time that you keep for it, but later as part of your day, uh, ensuring that they are kept away. So um, this is a practice that as a pair, as you, as adults build, when children walk into the house, they also get to understand how you navigate through uh, you know uh, through technology okay so that's that's the next one so we've we've spoken about staying independently about schedules about um, household chores about the use of technology we'll come into something simple of family recreation and vacations so again important to spend time outside uh, at at anything together doing something as a family together it could be a vocation it could be a, a certain skill it could be a holiday uh, it could be just a weekend or a or a, a you know couple of days out where you do things together to enjoy um, time together it could be a, a time of playing cards together so something that um, that we generally do as family. When I go to my parents' house, my, my parents are aged, they are 83 and 80. Um, and so when, when we gather together with our kids, we all you know have a couple of rounds of cards together because that keeps them uh, engaged, it keeps them distracted, and, and there's a lot of fun and energy that gets built in that. So doing something for recreation or uh, you know going on a holiday together where you like to do something, maybe swim together or hike together anything it doesn't have to be expensive it doesn't have to cost a lot of money um, but even just taking a day out from work and sitting together and probably playing a game of monopoly or anything anything that you enjoy together really builds the togetherness at the home so plan ensuring to plan days of rest and recreation is is um, very healing uh, for the family Okay. Another important factor is money and uh, budgeting and financial planning. So we do see that money becomes uh, a, a very significant area of uh, conflict uh, to, uh, you know, in marriages. Uh, wow, I'm still having questions of sexuality coming up. Okay, I, I will address this once we, we finish, Kennedy, okay? I will keep this and address it. Yeah, so money becomes... Um, uh, uh, an area of conflict. Uh, the reasons that it becomes an, a conflict is because, you know, as two people enter into marriage, they may have different values and understanding of how money um, money is seen. You know, so they 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 have different ideas about how money is used or the ways of it uh, it, it has been saved or the kind of lifestyles that they've come from or how it has been spent, how it has been earned, how it has been saved. So when two people come together, um, it is important that they discuss this and understand their the framework from which they're coming from. So you know, like, for example, when when there is one one of the uh, spouses maybe coming from a from a home where uh, where things have been very frugal, whereas the other uh, has been quite lavish. And um, and when two people come in together, they have their own ideas and concepts of how marriage, uh, uh, sorry, of how money needs to be used. So it it 
it often can mean very many different things. For some, it may be a sense of dependence. It can be a sense of security. For uh, for some, it can be um, you know a, 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 a something of not being able to trust others through that. So there are a lot of ideas that that focus around money and coming to a place of talking about it, discussing what money means, because it is it is an essential commodity that is needed for our living and for our growing, but yet it, it shouldn't become something that controls us. So having discussions about it and what one feels about it, the ideas of it, of it how it has been used um, uh, by a couple is something that definitely requires a, a discussion. On page, um, Sorry, I'm just looking up the page. On, on page uh, 90, 87, there is a, a small um, mm, a table that's given on, uh, on for you to being able to know how, you know, what is your, uh, uh, what is, what is your, your current value with money or how do you treat money okay and or how what do you understand of money and just going through that and uh, working this together okay with with your spouse or with with your fiance really helps to get a better understanding of the way that they see money and coming to a place of an agreement of how you would uh, need to see money there are certain things that i want to highlight here is when we are looking at money there are a couple of um, I, th I think three important uh, four important um, uh, principles that we want to bring up is the first one is an agreement to tithe okay uh, as a husband and wife uh, you know being able to agree to tithe based on the scripture that we see in Malachi 3 verses 8 to 10 which says will a man rob God yet you have robbed me but you say um, but you say, uh, how have we robbed you in tithes and offerings? So that's, it, it talks of how God would desires that we give him our first. We give him our best before we spend on anything else. And we see this in Proverbs also, where we are asked to honor the Lord with our possessions, with the first fruits of what we have. So when we would be in a better position, and I've heard this testimony after testimony of people uh, finding it easier to handle and having enough and more uh, in their finances when they have been prayerfully and willingly have tied, um, you know, their whatever it was due to God. So uh, handling that is something that is important and coming to that agreement that, that you will tithe and it is you will give to God's kingdom uh, is, is an agreement that you come up with. The second principle that we, when we look at is being able to formulate a budget. Formulating a budget is, um, helps you to um, really figure out what are the financial needs um, of your family. And, um, and, and thereby, you know, it kind of forms certain boundaries on how much you can spend and how much, uh, as a, how much you can spend in relation to how much you earn. So it is important for them to come and share that and come to a place of understanding, especially in couples where there is dual income. You know, sharing the information about that income, maybe developing a plan on how they can work on uh, um, categorizing their income is, is very important. Now, even as we're talking about budget, there are certain other things that may need to be looked into, which is saving and which is investing. So when we look at a, uh, you know, and I heard this somewhere and I thought it was uh, pretty useful, is if you're looking at 100% of, uh, uh, of money that's flowing in, uh, the first and foremost thing you would do is uh, tithing, like, like, like a 10% to, I mean, there's no upper limit. So you can decide that, but at least a 10%, one tenth of, of what you have received. So at one tenth, so let's say a 10 to 20% of your uh, your income on tithing, the 20% can go beyond. It's not a, it's not a, a cap, it's not a max cap, but I'm, I'm just giving you for the sake of our calculation here. A 10 to 20% of tithing, a 20% each uh, 
for saving and investing. So 20% to save and 20% to invest and uh, 50%. So depending on, you know, on, on what you have built, on a larger portion of it on spending and uh, you know, placing a budget on how much you will spend. So having this kind of a structure becomes very helpful to know how to deal with money. And if this can be discussed with, with the spouse, it, it really helps. Okay. Uh, saving and investing can be done in very many ways. And uh, the advice always given is to meet with a financial advisor who helps and guides you in making <clears throat> those right choices and, uh, uh, and, and right choices and also smart choices on how one can save and invest. So speaking to financial advisors really help. And it's no, and it's nothing wrong in planning ahead and um, uh, you know, uh, ensuring that you use the money that God has given you wisely for for um, for you as well as for the extension of His kingdom. So there is absolutely no nothing wrong in actually meeting with a financial advisor and uh, figuring that out. The fourth principle that we look into is to being able to set on certain short-term and long-term financial goals. Um, why is this important? It's because it gives you a good framework as to, uh, you know, like everything in life, you need a good framework as to how you want to conduct yourself. Like, for example, uh, you know, <clears throat> Uh, if if I were to take this parallelly to a physical goal, maybe you you have a goal to lose five kgs. So you, that's your maybe long term goal. Your short term goal is uh, uh, you know ensure that you don't eat too much of sugar in a week. So that's that's you know, that's a goal. So similarly, there it is important to work on these goals because it gives you a framework. It it helps you to come to a place of uh, deciding how you would want to. Uh, work through your goals. So what could be some of your personal goals? What could be certain long-term goals that you can identify? And this is something that you could do with, <clears throat> with your spouse. So those goals could be even investing in something bigger uh, uh, in order to uh, you know, help the children or help in their education. But it is important to plan all of this, that this, this requires work and this requires uh, preparation to do. All right. Okay. Uh, I think Anita has uh, written, being honest in paying tithe and offering has healed my daughter from wheezing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Anita, for sharing that. Okay. Uh, the uh, last, uh, last part of it is being able to care for extended family, the care of the extended family or care for the sick in the family. And we see there are multiple number of scriptures that, um, that uh, emphasizes the importance of us taking care of the family. Now, if, if uh, you know, just dating back to what we said initially, we did recommend that, you know, uh, that, that couples live independently. Nevertheless, it does not absolve anyone from taking care of the needs of the family. So as we do say that, you know, when you stay independently, it is in no way advocating that you do not support or, um, uh, you know, disconnect from the family. It does not mean that. It means to engage. It means to help. It means to honor. It means to bless uh, your family or, or your in-laws or people who may be within your um, uh, your uh, your family setting it is important to be of support and encouragement what we did what was mentioned of course the difference what we are looking at is maintaining those healthy boundaries and healthy relationships is a must it doesn't mean that you disconnect or not love them because you've been married so taking care of your parents your in-laws your extended family probably caring for any elderly or widowed um, in the family. Again, multiple scriptures are given. I'm not going to go through each of them. It is there in the textbook. You could, uh, you could read of it because it, it talks of how there is a blessing for those who take care of the poor. There, is, there are things that, are, um, that God, uh, God sees as blessed when we, 
given to the needs of the need when we give to the needs of the needy or the poor or the oppressed so th this all comes in the responsibility of managing a home of not just caring for those who may be immediately um, you know, with us but also those who who are in requirements who may have certain needs and special needs in dealing um, with uh, uh, with with their challenges that they may be going through okay so um, as we've gone through this, you know, the, these uh, six or seven items we've spoken about, it is important that these things are discussed and come in agreement with, that you agree how you would address these specific areas of uh, staying independently, of having your schedules, of managing the home, household chores, of uh, the use of technology, of money, um, of uh, budgeting, uh, of taking care of the elderly and and the people in your home. So these are uh, in in you know in, in a nutshell of how these things are important in building up the home and the family. Okay. Um, uh, is there any any specific question on this uh, um, on on this chapter uh, or or any thoughts or any any ideas that you'd like to share? And I, if not, I can uh, deal with uh, Kennedy's question. Yes, Harrison. Yes, Harrison. Okay. Um, yes. Um, okay, we've been dwelling around the um, marriage in you know, husband and wife. So I'm also looking at the aspect of um, in ministry now, where you also have, you know, some mature youths, you know, who are into relationships. And when you look at the relationship, okay, some are defined, and why some are not. And I'm, I'm talking out of experience because at the moment, you know, there are two sets of um, youths, you know, who are into a relationship in the church that, that is packing up feelings. Yes? And it's more like everybody's against, you know, their movement. Everybody's against their relationship because they feel that, since you know they are not married, you know such relationships should not be encouraged. So, mm -hmm. how do we contain or how do we advise such people to like you know deviate from such relationship so that mm -hmm. when they are ready for marriage, okay, it can be made known. That, okay, yes, you know we are ready for marriage. Then, being in a relationship where okay you're not coming to circuit that we want to get married but you're not in a relationship and you're a worker in the church so how do we contain such situations and how do we really address it so that it doesn't um bring um problem or chaos in the church thank you mm -hmm. thank you thank you that's uh, that's an excellent question um Okay, I, I, I want to deal with that question in a couple of parts. So the first and foremost thing, I think what um, the message uh, that we need to give or address is um, when we're looking at this word of dating or courtship, which is very commonly seen and taken on right now, there may not be direct indications and principles in the Bible about dating, but we can take on um, nuggets of truths from there. So the first and foremost, and I think young people, uh, which can be addressed to young people, is dating uh, is not for fun. Dating is for the purpose of marriage. Dating is not for fun, so it is the purpose of marriage. So dating is not a place where you try out somebody to find out who you're compatible with and then decide they may not be compatible. Okay, that's not um, biblically that I don't think is a right, right place. So dating should be for the sake of marriage. Now, what does dating entail? Dating is not marriage, which means uh, marriage is a place where boundaries are uh, loose, right? There are no boundaries in marriage. Whereas in dating uh, or in courtship, there still continues to be boundaries. 
And I don't just mean this by physical boundaries. I also mean this in the way of financial, spiritual, uh, um, emotional boundaries. Okay. Now, uh, what, what I what do I mean by these emotional boundaries? Is that or or you know even social boundaries for that matter? I've seen young couples, um, you know, once they are in a relationship, maybe not yet decided on marriage but in a relationship give up everything about their lives or their calling or their productivity or whatever God has called them to do and keeps it dependent on the relationship right that I believe is not what God wants us to do you what God has given you to do is to be faithful to take on whatever he has given you and to be faithful in that, in administering, in ensuring that you, um, you do what you need to do independent of that relationship. So that's something young people need to know and need to understand that um, even though you're in a relationship, uh, maybe to be married or maybe yet to decide, it is important you maintain those boundaries. Even uh, the way that you spiritually, um, you know, yes, connect. Yes, there is there is a time that you may pray together, come together. But does that eat into things of your own? Does that eat into your intimacy with God? Does does this does that does this uh, earthly uh, relationship um, hamper? on the relationship that you're building with God, your time of word, your time of study, your time of prayer, your time of fasting, your time of fellowship with those outside, your calling, that impact. So these are certain boundaries that we, we, we need to help young people to understand that, that that's something that needs to be maintained. I think an init an, another thing, of course, uh, this I know may be a lot cultural as well, is um, uh, but but I think it, it definitely has a biblical guideline, is um, getting the approval of elders, especially the family and other elders in the, um, you know, maybe in the church of knowing that uh, this this is an accepted relationship. It is it is due to be, you know, due to come together in marriage. Another piece of practical advice that I would say is, if a couple has decided to be married, um, you know, to ensure that it be done at a specific period of time. I mean, I, I wouldn't like to say time, but not prolonging it over months and over years and staying single um, and yet, you know, being in a place of falling into temptation. So these are certain principles I'd say is something that... Um, those of us maybe in ministry and probably in a in a higher position of ministry being able to help the young uh, seek on like i was saying you know as part of our youth groups as part of our um, you know i remember a couple of years back we had an entire youth meeting on dating and these were certain certain things that uh, you know we bought forth that there is a time there, are, there is a there is a season. There is a, there is a, a reason for dating. It cannot be done all because it's culturally accepted. I mean, you don't engage in it all because it's culturally accepted, or everyone's doing it, or you know, uh, someone fits you well. No, it 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 is there for the reason of uh, for the purpose of marriage, and it it should have certain. You know, certain discipline of time, certain discipline of boundaries that you that you're able to uh, keep as well. I hope I answered your question. Have a yes, second. please. Thank yes. you. Yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Okay. Someone's asked. Uh, okay, I'm just going to go back. There was some Kennedy asked a question. How do you improve your sexual life if it has become monotonous, boring, and not exciting? The key is communication, Kennedy talking about how it can be improved. It's like, you know, if you want to do a makeover of your home, you know, you and your wife want to do a makeover of your home, you would talk about it and say, hey, how can we make this better, right? Similarly, it is by communication. And often we see couples don't talk about sexuality, sex, uh, you know, in marriage. They don't talk about it. They don't talk about the experience they've had. They don't talk about what they want. They don't talk about what seems desirous to them. 
um, it could be very simple practical things maybe just getting some you know uh, you know like uh, 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 the body of a woman is very appealing for for her husband right so just having some good clothes or you know a lack of it maybe just just being able to doing something that will that will uh, spice up that time of engagement and i think that's something can i mean this is very individual in nature right um so discussing and talking and communicating about it definitely uh, builds a lot more excitement in it okay uh there's another question okay we are time but if you can give me five minutes we can uh, just address these questions slightly off topic i have a question on marriage vow that came up during a conversation sometime last week isn't it asked of us to not take any vows and our yes to be yes and our no to be no okay this is a commitment. Um, okay, I don't know how different this is. Uh, okay, Samuel, I, I just need some time to think. I can't think of something off my head on this. I'm just going to take your question and, and I'm just going to... Uh, can I address it next time, Samuel, please? Because I, sure, I, I, I sure, don't want sure. to no say something... Uh, no problem, absolutely. Which may be an error, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, so Sri Kumar says, how can we guide someone who wants to be in... in in a living relationship you don't guide someone you can tell them that that's not that is definitely not in god's um view of a relationship a living relationship is sin so if they're believers you can tell them hey buddy you know that this is outside of what this is sexual sin pastor uh, can i yeah yes yes Thank please Yes, Shrikumar. Yeah, the pastor, in case um, if they have already decided, like, uh, you know, uh, that um, they want it to be like they they have already decided in their mind. So my question was not how to guide them for that, but okay. how to guide them. <laughs> how to it, guide them to come. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. All right. sorry, sorry. It's okay. Because they okay. decided in their mind that you know, they wanted to uh, get married and, uh, together yeah. and they wanted to decide that whether this they are made for each other not or not. Actually, mm -hmm. this um, a female has discussed with her mother and a fa not father, but her mother. But uh, she approached me and she asked me to pray for it. So that's why I just wanted to know that um, like mm -hmm. in, in this case is like, you no, know, she's very young, like, you no, know, mm -hmm. and uh, she wanted to uh, stay with the boy and uh, wanted to uh, find out that whether he's a suitable person, person or not. Mm -hmm. So in that case, how we uh, have to counsel or how we have to take how to guide them. Thank you. That's mm -hmm. Yeah. Person. All right. Thank you. Harrison, do you have an answer to him? And if you have, you can, or was yours a question? Um, is, um, what he just said now is very, very important. And that was why I asked that question. Because, you know, when we look at it now, this situation we're talking about can be very, can be very, very, um, can be very, very sensitive. Because when um, parents have consented to the relationship, then what, uh, what can you do about it? So it's okay. either, okay, you want to accept it or you want to see how you can manage this whole situation or you, you're like, okay, go ahead, you know, but I cannot you know, have this you know, under my watch. And it's more like, okay, you've made them you know, leave the church or something and people want to blame you for for things you know that you feel that you know is the right thing to do hmm. so in a case you know like this it's just something that her uh, grace you know has to speak mm -hmm. so i'm just like yeah yeah i think uh, um, one of the the specific things is we bring the word of god to them and uh we need, we cannot, we don't mince God's word. We say what God's word says, which is sin. A live-in relationship is sin. Even if they claim that they may not be sexual uh, re uh, interactions, it is still, it is, it is sin, right? To uh, a man and a woman living under one roof is, you know, it's like playing with fire, 
by the, an unmarried man, unmarried woman living under one roof is playing with fire. We need to present God's word as it is and say what they are engaging in is sin. And that as a minister, as a pastor, is something you need to communicate, not just to the couple, but maybe to the parents who may be willing for this engagement or, or for the for this um, for the way that it is it is on. So that's something that as a minister we should be doing to being able to bring about corrective discipline over their lives. Yes, what they do in the four walls of their home maybe is not something that uh, you may have control over, but you know, as the scripture says, when when your brother is wrong, you know, go gently lead them, gently rebuke them, take the elders of the uh, of of the church to do so, and to to be able to get them out of the sin that they are in. But if they continue to refuse to do that, I think you need to take a call on how it impacts the rest of the community, the rest of your fellowship, because there are other young people watching, right? And I'm sure, Harrison, that's what you also have in mind, that there are, uh, maybe this couple is an example to many people. And if they seem to be in sin, you're also permitting or allowing something that, uh, that, that shouldn't be um, to be prevalent. So that's when you t you can take a call with the elders of your church to decide on how you would like to bring about further discipline if after a couple of warnings in love and in patience, having done so, if they're not able to do that, you know, you can come to a place of making those decisions. If they go ahead. Um, yeah, yes, Harrison. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's just like um, there's a situation I addressed and, and, there's one thing I said, um, ministry is not being emotional or, you know, doing ministry is not you being emotional because you being emotional, you go against, you know, God's will. And if you really love somebody, you should be, you should be, should be able to be bold and confident enough, you know, to tell them the truth, you know, when it's even difficult to tell them the truth. Because there are some times, you know, you just want to bend the truth, you know, so that you don't hurt people. But Correct. it's better you tell the truth. So let it hurt whoever it needs to hurt. But Absolutely. But you know that you've done the right thing. Absolutely. So that's what, that's what I want to share. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Harrison. All right. Uh, we are, uh, we have crossed 11 o'clock. Uh, and I think there is one more question from Christopher. Christopher, I'm going to take down your question and uh, we will address this. Um, I think Christopher's question, uh, yes, about leaving the church. How do you ask someone to leave the church? Okay, uh, uh, we will address this next. I'm going to take this uh, question as well, as well as Sam's question and the question that Kennedy brought up on surrogacy. Uh, we will look at these questions uh, when we meet next time. All right, thank you so much. Let's just uh, close with a word of prayer, please. Uh, may I ask, um, may I ask somebody to pray? Um, Nisha, would you kindly pray, please? Nisha? Nisha? Okay, Nisha is in there. Uh, um, all right, uh, anybody else? Um, Rose? Rose, would you like to pray, please? Yes, Pastor. Sure, please, go ahead, yeah. Rose. Father in heaven, we thank you for today. We thank you for the past two hours that we have learned about your ways, your holiness, your principles, Father. Father, we thank you that you have supplied the wisdom and the words that you have spoken through, Pastor Jean, today. Father, we thank you that this online school, you are making us more equipped in the knowledge of you and your ways. Uh, thank you that you have gathered us into one place from all far corners of the world. Thank you for making us, uh, giving us the understanding, Father, especially in this 
uh, subject that we have about marriage, Father. Thank you, Father, that you are uh, letting us grow more and more, Father, in the knowledge of making our marriages, for those of us who are married, Father, for our marriage to be solid and based on your word. Father, make the understanding we receive today take root in our hearts and let them bear fruit. And as we carry on our ways and our individual callings that you have placed in our lives, direct us with the word, direct us with your Holy Spirit. And let us not only be hearers, but also doers and enforcers of what you say and command. Father, we ask this all in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, Rose. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you all. Thank you so much. We will meet next week. Is that your Thank little you, daughter, Samuel? Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.